Hi guys, James at Rampant Line Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to head over to America once again and we're going to return to a brewery who I've not had anything from in quite a while actually. And the only beer I think that I've had uh, and reviewed for you here on the channel from this brewery was actually a collaboration that they did with Sigtuna Breukus, who are from a little bit to the north of Stockholm here in Sweden. So it's going to be interesting to do my first dedicated review to this brewery. So for this review then, we are going to head to Elmsford in New York State over on the east coast in America, um, about an hour and a half I guess to the north of Manhattan and we're doing another beer review from Captain Lawrence Brewing Company, my first dedicated review to them as I said. This is the Tears of Green and this particular version is the Citra and Mosaic one. Um, they've got quite a few different versions of this beer that seem to be different ABVs and they've got different hops and things in this. So this one is the Tears of Green Citra and Mosaic version. It's a New England IPA coming in at 7.5% ABV and we got this beer through the Tilfelid Sortiment in Seistenbolaga on the 27th of March 2020 here in Sweden. So hopefully we'll get a few more of the beers. I have seen a couple of the Captain Lawrence things coming through the uh, the small parties and I need to make sure I review some of the other ones. But they're supposed to be a very, very good brewery. The last beer that I had, the collaboration with Sigtuna, I was really impressed with. So hopefully my first beer that I have from these guys properly, if you like, will turn out to be very nice as well. But we're seeing more and more of this brewery over here in Europe now. So hopefully they are here to stay. Quite we get It tends to be the case that we'll get an American brewery for a little bit of time and they'll disappear and we'll not see them again. That's quite common actually over in Europe unfortunately but hopefully these guys are here to stay because they do have a pretty good reputation uh, from what I've heard. So let's see how we get on with this one. Very curious to see how this beer turns out. So as always with my reviews then I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Captain Lawrence Brewing Company before. As I said, this is my first dedicated review to them and hopefully I can add more reviews to that list in the near future. There's all the usual social media down there as well. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system so you can go into the home page and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, prefetch or whatever it is you're in interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries. There is one there for all the American beers that I've reviewed for you. That's being added to whenever I get the opportunity, which is fairly regularly, to be honest with you. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely hugely appreciated. So anyway, to tell you a little bit about Captain Lawrence Brewing Company then, on to my brewery notes. So Captain Lawrence Brewing Company, as I mentioned to you earlier, are based in Elmsford in New York, which looks as if it's about an hour and a half or so north of uh, Manhattan in New York State. But the company was founded back in 2006 by Scott Vaccaro, who had been a home brewer since 1995. But apparently he saw a friend's dad brewing beer when he was young and he asked if he could join in. So it turned out that he'd brewed his first beer before he was even allowed to drink it. Um, but Scott went to university to study accountancy originally, but he later transferred to the University of California at Davis to study fermentation science. And then he interned during that degree at Adams Brewery in England. Following his graduation, he went to work for Sierra Nevada and then for the now defunct Colorado Brewery in Danbury up in Connecticut. But the first brewery these guys had was on Castleton Street in Pleasantville, New York and they had a 20 barrel system there. They stayed there for five years before they needed to expand and this took them to their current location in Elmsford, New York which was about five miles from their previous brewery. So they started brewing there in 2011 and it's equipped with a 40 barrel system and they also have a smaller 7 barrel system as well for making pilot brews and also um, they've got a far larger fermentation capacity as well so they're able to produce their beers on a far kind of grander scale than they were originally if you like. They've also got their beer hall restaurant and tap room at the brewery as well that you can visit and uh, they've got a good number of different beers that I think are tap only and things like that but they've got lots of cans that you can buy on site and the restaurant is supposed to be pretty good so uh, I don't know maybe I can get up there and have a visit to this brewery but uh, I just need to see what my time is like when I'm over there in September if I can still get over there we need to see with all this kind of virus stuff that's going on we just need to keep our fingers crossed and see if that can clear up actually but I really want to get out to uh, the US in the next while and uh, 
and, and see some of the breweries out there. I, I really hope that my New England trip that I had planned for September can come off actually. But as of March 2020, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced around 1,050 different beers. But like I said to you, um, I think with quite a few of the IPAs and things they do, there's different versions of them using different hops. So the different IPAs obviously have different base recipes and then they are just kind of playing around with the hops on top of that and, and tweaking things and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it really interesting interesting brewery this one as I said they seem to be kind of reading their head a little bit more over here in Europe these days so hopefully they are here to stay because they're supposed to have a pretty damn good reputation actually so um, yeah that's all you really need to know about Captain Lawrence Brewing Company for the moment if you want to learn more of course you can check out the brewery website in the description below you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on and you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn more about the different beers that they've done so um, yeah yeah, let's get on and actually have a taste of this one then. So as I said to you at the start of the video, this one is a 7.5% uh, New England IPA. I don't know if you can technically call this a double IPA then. I'm a bit kind of hazy on where the exact um, area is, but I guess 7.5% is sort of right on the border. I would always say an Imperial Stout is one above 8% and I'd be tempted to say the same for an IPA, but... You know, an IPA is a different kind of beer, you expect those to be a bit lighter in alcohol. But 7.5% New England IPA regardless, we can argue about the exact sub-style all day. But really nice artwork on this one. And the artwork that you get on these tiers of green beers, it tends, there's a few labels there listed on Untapped uh, that have different colours and things. And as I say, they release different versions of this beer with different hops. But you can see this label, of course, has been specially printed for the Swedish market. So maybe this beer has been released in America at a previous time and then they've brewed another batch of it to send over here to, to Sweden a little bit later on. So I don't know. Let me know if you're watching from the States. Um, do let me know when you would have had this particular version of Tears of Green. I know that Massive Matt and uh, the Beer Patrol, those guys, have both um, have both tried different versions of this beer on their channel. But I'm curious to do my first uh, review from Captain Lawrence Brewing Company. And probably after I, uh, I film this one, I'll probably go and watch Massive Matt's review. So make sure you check out his channel if you, um, you haven't watched him already. Massive beer reviews, really nice guy. And maybe you'll see him feature on my channel sometime in September if I can get out to the States. But let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the taste. And I'm really curious to see how this one turns out. So Citra and Mosaic. So as we know, Citra tends to give you some really nice um, mango type flavours and you can get a lot of tropical fruit complexity out of that as well, lychees, gooseberries, and um, papayas, apricots, all of these kind of things and mosaic gives you a lovely sort of tangerine orange quality and I will say that as soon as you open the can up of this one you can smell the, um, you can really smell some of that tangerine orange from the mosaic in my mind. Does it say who has imported this one actually? Um, it will say on the Sustainable Agate website, but I wonder if it's been imported by Galatea, because I think that might have been the reason um, that they did the collaboration with Sigtuna Brewers originally. And of course, Sigtuna are associated with the big Swedish food company Galatea. So I don't know if it is Galatea that might have imported this one here to Sweden, but it doesn't matter. It's more about the beer rather than who imported the thing, isn't it? But yeah, as you can see, this one's poured a lovely bright yellow. You could see there was about a solid finger of a quite bumpy, frothy white head on this one when we poured it, and that's just faded away to be a kind of thin, bumpy sort of layer. One or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass, a few little ones heading up towards the bottom of that head there. If I stick my fingers behind the glass, you can see that this one, um, it's not the haziest and kind of soupiest of New England IPAs that you're going to come across, but it certainly does have that level of opacity that you kind of expect from the New England IPAs. If I shine the light through this one, it is quite a bright yellow colour, but I really like how um, how this one looks. I mean, the, you tend to get ones, some of them can be very, very thick and, and soupy, um, but I've got a feeling that this one might be a more kind of crisp, drinkable New England IPA. I've found that, that recently there does seem to be a trend going towards the New England IPAs being a little bit less thick and a bit more kind of um, crisp and drinkable, I guess you could say. The Scandinavian breweries are certainly going that way, so it'll be interesting to see what Captain Lawrence is like. And do let me know about the mouthfeel of these beers in the comment section below. It'll be interesting to know if, if these beers have evolved a little bit over time. The other thing to consider, of course, is that just palates are changing. As you drink more and more of a style, you get more 
kind of used to certain things. But in terms of its appearance, this beer is not really surprising for a New England IPA, one of the lighter coloured ones that you're going to come across and you can see the head on this one is pretty much gone. So let's have a look at the aroma then and see how we get on. Oh yeah, so straight away with this one you can smell that lovely kind of wheaty breadiness to the malt base. It actually comes across as being really quite smooth to be honest with you. There's a really lovely kind of smooth white bready wheaty kind of thing coming out of this beer. Um, I, I really like how that that goes together in this one I have to say. Um, yeah, the aroma of this beer is very very nice. Um, so yeah, straight away with this one you're going to notice that kind of smooth white bready wheaty quality in there. I do wonder if there's a little bit of rye, there is a sort of graininess to the, the backbone of this. It could be the yeast strain as well because some of these yeast strains that are used in the New England IPAs tend to smell a little bit more farmhousey, but then they smoothen out in the mouthfeel a little bit. That was the thing that really surprised me with Heady Topper, was that it was more of a kind of farmhouse IPA, quite like the fake IPAs that are coming out of Norway these days. But um, yeah, there's definitely a little bit of that sort of woody, vegetally, farmhousey kind of thing in the malt base as well, but you've got a little bit of an almost grainy, ryeish quality to it. And mixing in with that too, but you can really smell the smoothness of the wheat and the more that you smell and the more deeply that you take it in, the kind of smoother and sweeter it starts to come out. You definitely get more of the oaty kind of creaminess out of this beer the more you smell it as well. And there's also a wee bit of a kind of biscuity quality to this one too. So yeah, the, the, the malt base, the malty side of this beer really has everything that you would expect. Um, I really, I like how this one goes together. The malt base, it really, when you take this one in, it is a little bit more farmhousey, but then as you smell it more and more, you start to get that more kind of smoother, creamy type note out of it as well. And as I say, there is a wee degree of sweetness from a kind of biscuity malt base in there as well. So this is one that really evolves on the nose quite nicely. So yeah, kind of, there's nothing overly surprising about the, the malt base in this one. It is quite typical for the style, of course. Um, and that's it these days, you know, the New England IPA, it's, it's that popular, I drink so many of them, they're not going to surprise you um, nine times out of ten, you know, it is just about how well crafted they are and how nice and drinkable they are. So, um, yeah, in terms of the hoppy side of things then, let's look at that. So on the green side of the hops, I would say this one, it does have a little bit of floral character to it, both of the hops in this one are kind of high alpha acids, but... Um, you know the New England IPA it's usually about 30 IBUs and if it's dry hopped if these beer these things are dry hopped they are not going to contribute to the bitterness even though citrus like 11% alpha acid and mosaic is 13 or 14 and um, that's not going to contribute much to the bitterness so on the green side of the hops for me a bit of floral character in there but it really leans a bit more towards the um, it really leans a little bit more towards the um, kind of biscuity um, it really leans a little bit more towards the kind of biscuity, um, not biscuity, the more kind of grassy side of things there. I don't know why I said biscuity, I keep having brain farts in these videos these days. But yeah, it's got that lighter, more kind of grassy quality there. And as I, the thing that's made me think biscuity is it really does get a little bit more sweet the more you smell of it, this beer. But on the fruity side of things then, a little bit of a... You do get some of that juicy kind of mango from the uh, from the citra in there. You've got a nice little bit of some kind of passion fruity qualities as well. I think those are more minimal. I find this to be a more light kind of mangoey, papaya, apricotty type tropical fruit. And you also get a little bit more of that oily tangerine orange in this beer as well from the mosaic. And I think I want to say there's a wee bit of a sort of um, gooseberry-ish, lychee kind of quality in here too. But yeah, the aroma of this one is really quite nice. It does get a little bit more of a kind of floral kick to it, the more that you smell of it as well. So um, yeah, let's see how we get on with this one then. I'm, I'm really curious about this beer. The aroma is really quite nice. A nice, sorry, juicy, uh, lighter, tropical smelling New England IPA. So this one is the, um, the Tears of Green Citra and Mosaic version from Captain Lawrence Brewing Company in Elmsford over in New York State the north of Manhattan in America. Let's get stuck in. Slanger, skull. Oh yeah. That really has a wee bit of a fruity bite to it. 
when you take it in, but it smooths out very, very nicely. It is kind of as I suspected from the from the aroma too. It does come across as quite a crisp, um, drinkable New England IPA. I mean, it's seven point five percent for it to be this drinkable. That's starting to get into dangerous territory. I mean, if I remember right, the Julius from Treehouse that I had, that's six point nine. Then the green, um, or what was the other? I forget. But the purple one. The green, oh no, the green was the hazy, I think it was. Um, so there was the the green was the 7.2 one, and then the hazy, I think, was the the 8% one. This one is quite, um, it's got the drinkability of the Julius to it, but it's obviously got a bit more booze to it. That's the, the interesting thing about this one. But I will say straight away, this is a pretty damn good um, New England IPA. I mean, this is this is really solid, so well done to Captain Lawrence Brewing Company for this. One of the wee bits of satisfaction I always get from trying these American beers too is that when you compare these to the likes of the the breweries that we have over here, I mean in Scandinavia we have, uh, you know, we've got Gamma and Dry and Bitter from uh, from Copenhagen. We've got Stieg Beer, it's OO Brewing, Dugis, Beer Bibliothek, you know, we've got these guys in Gothenburg, Omnipoyo in Stockholm, then you've got Amundsen and Lervig producing really nice stuff up in Norway as well. When you compare these breweries to what the Americans are producing, it just kind of shows you, you know, that the quality of beer that we have over here in Europe is pretty damn good because this beer, it is, you know, it is really, really nice, but the quality isn't so much different from what we get over here. That's one of the comforts I always get from trying these American beers. And I like how they are a little bit different. I mean, I find this beer very light and crisp and drinkable, um, which is different to the European ones. The European ones, I think, they feel a little bit kind of thicker and creamier and things. To me, this is one of the crispest, the most crisp um, New England IPAs that I've come across. But it still packs a hell of a lot of flavour, actually. So yeah, try this one if you get the chance. This is it's stupidly easy to drink. It's crazy. So yeah, um, let's try and break down the flavour of this one then and see what we get. In the middle of your palate, you can feel that lovely kind of white bready wheaty quality. That blankets the middle of the tongue. The further that you go into the aftertaste, you can feel the middle of your palate sort of dry out a little bit, and you start to get the more kind of grainy qualities pushing their way out of the beer. There is a little bit of an almost rye-ish kind of note to this beer. I don't know if it said, does it say if there's rye in here? So, no, apparently there's not. It doesn't have um, rogue. It doesn't say rogue in the Swedish. So, um, yeah, I don't know where the graininess would be coming from. It must be the yeast, uh, actually. But yeah, you really get a little bit of that. You've got the wheaty, white bready base. That dries out a little bit and gives you some more kind of graininess the further that you go into the, the aftertaste of the beer. As you move further forward on the palate, you start to get some nice um, kind of oaty creaminess to this one as well. Yeah, that's it's, it's nice that... Um, at the same time, though, the oaty creaminess isn't really that prominent. You've seen how long it was since I took a sip of this one. You start to get that kind of oaty creaminess towards the, the front of the palate now, a couple of seconds later. But if you go towards the back of the palate, you'll get a more kind of bitey element from the wheat. Um, you know, it's, it's almost, it reminds me of some of the Trillium beers a little bit. I remember the Trillium ones being very bitey in their wheaty quality, but this one really has a, a good level of uh, crispness to it. And I would say that overall, it leans more towards the wheaty end of the spectrum. The wheaty notes at the back of the palate really sit there and push their way out further into the aftertaste. If you go to the very centre of your uh, your tongue, you will get a little bit of a biscuity quality there, but it's a lot less prominent, I think, than uh, it comes across as being in the aroma. So the malt base for me really is quite wheaty and bitey, a little bit grainy, little touch sweet, but mainly um, quite crisp, actually. I like how this how this one goes together. It's a nice, light, crisp sort of thing. I've repeated that a few times, to be honest. Let's move on to the hoppy side of the beer. And I think we've got this one just in really nice condition, actually. I think I've always said with New England IPAs, you need to let them mature in the can for two or three, probably two, about two weeks, just to let them mellow out a little bit. And this one is in really good nick at the moment. 
So yeah, on the hoppy side of things. Back corners of the palette, there is a little touch of earthiness there. I think that will be from the mosaic, but I'd be curious to know what the base hop in this beer is. I don't think it's Columbus, it's a bit too spicy to be Columbus. Could it be like Tomahawk or something like that? Um, but yeah, you get a nice... Um, slightly darker earthiness there, but as you come further forward along the sides of the palate, that really very quickly evolves to be a more kind of quite spicy floral aromatic note, and that continues towards the front corners of the palate. Around the front curve of the tongue, it's a little bit lighter and grassy, and then behind the front curve of the palate, that's where you get that little oily bubble where those juicy fruity esters start to push their way out of the beer. And um, for me, the fruitiness on this one is, is really nice. It definitely has a little bit of pungency to it, which is interesting. So yeah, when you take it in, it really is quite pungent, but then the way it just, the esters just kind of roll out and become that bit more juicy, it's really nice. When you go to the back of that oily bubble, um, you get a wee bit of a kind of passion fruity sort of... Um, you do get a wee bit of a passion fruity kind of um, darker tropical fruit. It's not quite dark enough to be grapefruit, I don't think. But as you come further forward from that, it becomes a little bit more mango-like. You'll start to get a few kind of papaya, apricotty notes. But to me, the, the the citra notes that you get out of this do lean a bit more towards that darker um, passion fruity type note. But then as you reach the very front part of your palate, it's got a lovely kind of um, tangerine orangey, oily quality to the beer, which is, is nice. I really like how that that side of it comes out. The fruit, as I say, makes a really interesting transition. It comes in, it's a little bit sharp, and then it just rolls out and becomes that little bit more kind of oily and sweet the further you go into the aftertaste. But yeah, on the edge of the palate too, you do get a little touch of a I think there is a, a, a very light element of a kind of gooseberry lychee sort of thing and that's one of the kind of subtleties you can get from citra sometimes but really it's quite, it, the citra comes out as quite a dark tropical influence in this beer and the mosaic gives you that typical kind of um, slightly oily tangerine orangey quality that you get from it. Um, it's not quite as oily as Amarillo right enough but the way these kind of two things contrast each other is quite nice. So the darker tropical fruit gives you a good balance with the more bitey, wheaty side of the beer, but then the mosaic gives you that lighter, kind of juicy quality going further into the aftertaste. So um, yeah, the flavour on this one for me is really quite nice. The thing that lingers there into the aftertaste is the wheaty quality, um, a little bit of the... Um, a little bit of the... Um, the kind of graininess in the malt base as well and you've also got some nice big floral notes and a little bit of a kind of juicy fruity kind of thing there as well but the fruits are the fruits interesting i'd say the fruits the most kind of quirky side of this beer a bit dark and tropical but also um oily and citrusy too from the oranges so yeah this is just a, this is a really interesting beer in terms of its flavor composition it has made me think a little bit and i'd say that generally it's quite a crisp and drinkable New England IPA. So um, yeah, let's look at the mouthfeel quickly then. So yeah, yeah. I mean, fairly mid-bodied, pretty much middle of the road. Carbonation, I think, has a bit of crispness too, which is good. I do wonder if they've, they've used a little bit of Pilsner malt or something in this. It doesn't. You don't quite get that vibe at the back of the palate, but you do get a nice little level of um, crispness out of this beer. Um, some really lovely, um, some lovely kind of smoothness, some, how do we say, um, it's got this, I'd say that overall this, the mouthfeel of this one is quite wet and quite clean and at the same time quite crisp, I think that's a good way to sort of, to, to kind of sum it up. You've got some lovely kind of floral um, aromatic qualities to this one which gives it a good bitterness, I think this beer must be about 50-ish IBUs, it's definitely higher than your standard 30, maybe about 50 or 60, somewhere in that kind of region. The malt base, lovely crispness to it, lovely bit of wheaty bite, and then you've got some juicy um, tropical and, uh, and oily fruits coming out of this one too. But overall, just a really nice drinkable New England IPA. It reminds me a little bit of Amundsen from Norway, but it also reminds me a little bit of the kind of Trillium stuff. It's got that more bitey kind of wheaty quality to it as well, actually. So um, yeah, let's leave it at that. This one was the Citra and Mosaic version of the Tears of Green 
A New England IPA at 7.5% ABV from Captain Lawrence Brewing Company in Elmsford, New York, to the north of Manhattan. Really cool to do my first dedicated review to this brewery, and I'm sure I'll review a few more uh, beers from these guys at some point fairly soon. But yeah, thank you again for watching my reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Captain Lawrence Brewing Company as well. It'd be cool to return to these guys at some point soon and I'm sure uh, they will appear through the Tilfeli sortiment sometime again here in Sweden. Thanks again for watching, check out my social media and I'll catch you guys later. Slanju, Sko, cheers, make sure you check out Massive Matt uh, as well at Massive Beer Reviews for more regular reviews on Captain Lawrence. Cheers.